You will be in listen-only mode for this webinar, but we will reserve some time after Ken's presentation for a question and answer session. You can submit your questions at any time through the questions box on the GoToWebinar control panel. But don't worry if we aren't able to get to your questions today. We'll forward them on to Ken and the team at 700 Credit so they can respond to you directly via email. Lastly, if you have any difficulty during today's webinar, please make sure to just click on the hand icon on the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get to that uh, problem as quickly as possible. So let's get to your compliance questions right away in Ken's presentation. Ken, the webinar platform is now yours. Okay, thanks Nick, and I appreciate it, and thanks for everybody for taking time out today uh, to learn a little bit more about compliance. Uh, the, the, you've accomplished the first step, which is uh, understanding you might need to know a little bit more than you might know today. Um, uh, first, a little disclaimer, uh, I'm not an attorney, so this information shouldn't be uh, uh, construed as legal advice, and uh, by all means, uh, we encourage you to consult with outside counsel in determining um, your, your best course of action and, and finalizing policies that your dealership um, is required to have in place. Uh, as Nick mentioned, some of the things we're going to be talking about today, uh, which is just a chunk of, you know, what... Uh, um, is being asked of dealers to, ha to have in place today in terms of compliance. Um, red flags, risk-based pricing, adverse action, privacy notices, and uh, then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. Um, a little bit about uh, what's behind each of these laws and the, the purpose of uh, you know, the government's intention uh, when they put these laws into place. Um, red flags. Uh, they, you know, they, it was an attempt to help fight identity theft. Um, Risk-based pricing notices, they want to ensure that consumers are aware of what's on their credit file, the power of the credit file, and you know, what they can do to ensure the information is accurate. Um, adverse action, you know, to notify consumers that there is a, a public database out there that in the domain that has negative information on them so that they can be aware of that and validate it, and make sure it's accurate. And then privacy notices, you know, ensuring consumers are aware of how their information is going to be used. Um, I'm going to start today with the red flag program because that seems to be uh, the most well-defined uh, program, extensively defined, of what's expected by dealers. Um, and uh, you can see the first highlighted rule here is that dealers are required by law to have a written identity theft pr protection in place, an ITPP. Now, this is important because a, a big theme of today is going to be that you know, dealers have to have these written policies in place. Um, the first thing an auditor is going to ask for is, you know, what are your written policies and how are they being enforced? Um, so if you don't have policies in place, that's going to raise a flag right away with the auditor. So what we try to really promote with our dealers is to have these policies in place and ensure that they're being followed by the dealership. Um, training is very important, making sure that the policy has a training component, an auditing and monitoring component so that you're, you're monitoring your compliance. Uh, there's a reporting aspect that's educating um, upper management as to the status of compliance is also very important. Um, the ITP, uh, the red flag law states that you must have a compliance officer. So if you don't have anyone charging your dealership with monitoring compliance and ensuring that you have policies in place and that they're being followed, you need to do so. You need to define someone at your dealership, um, and even at the at the cost that it you, you know might cost you half a resource or might cost you to hire someone. You really need to have that person in place and defined. Um, so what what is red flag? Uh, red flag, there's three key components. You know, there's an OFAC database search that must be performed. Uh, many dealers had that in place prior uh, to the red flag 
legislation coming out, but it's specifically mentioned in, in the red flag legislation. Um, the second component is address verification. You need to verify the address of the applicant. And also, you need to check fraud, fraudulent databases, databases that contain known fraudulent addresses, something uh, that's checking the master death file, um, validating the Social Security number, making sure it's a valid Social Security number. So you're really validating the identity. Um, most of these things and most of the products on the marketplace today do these things automatically at the, uh, the time that you do the credit check. Another component of the red flag is that you also have to validate the ID. Um, you have to ensure that the ID that's presented matches the application. And it must be a government ID. It must compare, uh, appear unaltered. And the applicant uh, image and description you know, must match the person that's sitting in front of you. He can't be, you know, he can't be um, uh, you know, five foot person sitting down and his driver's license says he's 6'2", you know, 280. He's, it's got a match. Um, and an important piece of the red flag is what happens when there are mismatches? What happens uh, if there is an address discrepancy? If, if, um, some of the public databases take quite some time if someone moves. Um, they change their address for some reason. Uh, the, the databases aren't going to be aligned with what they're applying for in their application. So what do you do? You have to remediate it. And how do you remediate it? Um, there's manual methods. You, you can ask for additional forms of ID. You can ask for utility bills. Um, very similar processes to when you go and apply for a driver's license based on your state. That Those um, requirements vary from state to state, but they often require additional forms of ID, utility bills to validate that person is who they say they are. Um, of course, what's wrong with manual methods? Sometimes uh, dealership at a dealership, if uh, they don't have an additional form of ID or utility bill with them, who brings that when they buy a car? They have to go home. And you don't want that. So one of the, the methods that we provide, and I know there's other um, providers out there that offer similar methods, is our wallet questions. Out of wallet questions validate that person is who they say they are, so you're remediating any alerts that might occur through your automated processes. Um, an out of wallet question, some of you might be familiar with those. Uh, it's an authentication where they'll ask you certain questions that only you might know, and it's it's typically not based on credit data. It's based on public record information where you've lived in the past. Um, information about your the vehicle that you're driving, um, and various other information. You know, the address, maybe an address you lived at. What county did it reside in? Um, which is a known address? So there's various questions that are presented to the consumer, and that if he answers them at that point of sale, he doesn't have to leave your dealership. You've remediated that. Now, part of uh, best practices is that you have to. There's a reporting and monitoring component. So you have to monitor who failed the automated processes and how you remediated them. So that's a, a big plus as to why out of wallet questions and, a, and your system provider that provides you with your, your credit reports and maybe doing your red flag process uh, provides you with the out of wallet questions because it ties into the auditing reporting because you have to um, prove that you have processes in place that when there was an alert, there was an address mismatch, how did you verify the identity and verify that you did it? So um, you want to try and automate as much of this as possible, and, and having out a wild questions is a good tool to have that. Uh, what's at stake if you don't have a red flag? Well, it's a per occurrence fine of $3,500. So if you're not doing any um, red flag remediation now and you're audited, it's almost every applicant that you're going to be fined for. Uh, if you do have a portion of it in place, then maybe the, the fine will be just for a portion of your, but at any cost, it, it's 
the stakes are high, and it's better to have a, a program in place than none at all, because your dealership could be at stake if the fines uh, they can grow pretty exponentially. Um, and I think with when an auditor comes in, if he sees that you have your your head in the sand and you're not doing anything, they're going to come down pretty hard on you. If you have policies in place, and if you're following those policies, even if they don't match the letter of the law, the auditor is going to show some leniency, and he's also probably not going to dive as deep as if you have no policies in place, and they're going to look to find you wherever they can. So just uh, to recap here quickly, um, you know, what must your dealership have in place? You really need to have an actual document that defines your policies and procedures for red flag and how you're enforcing those in the dealership and following those in the dealership. Um, it, you know, the, it has to, one of the recommendations we're going to make is that you consolidate where you're pulling credit from because if you're pulling credit out of two or three different systems, your policies and procedures have to cover two or three systems, which means your auditing has to cover two or three systems. Your monitoring has to cover two or three systems. So you're really increasing your workload on that compliance person. Um, if you consolidate it, then it, you only have to define it for that one system where you're pulling credit. Um, you know, to define how you're going to perform identity verification for each applicant. Um, you know, does this policy, you know, at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself on how applicants come into your dealership or into your systems to pull credit. Does your policy cover 100% of those applicants? You know, you're getting web applications from um, maybe a, a lead generating system over here. You're pulling credit over there. You know, how does credit get pulled? How is red flag being performed? And it has to cover 100%. Uh, again, who's going to monitor? So define who your compliance officer is and who is going to be responsible for this. Um, and one of the things that they're they're really talking about now, too, is your reporting. It's the reporting management has to be a piece of this. Management has to ensure that this is in place. So you have to document how you're reporting it to management. How is management becoming aware uh, that everything is uh, in place to ensure your dealership is compliant? So make sure that, um, that management is a part of your monitoring and reporting. So some of the things that you should be looking for in your credit reporting solution is that uh, you, you want the system to tell you when red flags occur and when they were uh, remediated. Um, you know, I pulled 100 applicants, 80 of them, everything was OK. These 20 over here, there was a, an alert, and we remediated this 20. And you can see that we remediated these 20. Um, and a report that shows that, uh, some type of monitoring utility that shows who uh, it was remediated for and who maybe it was not remediated for, so you can handle those. Uh, somebody has a work queue that looks at ones that were not remediated. Um, you, you want a provider that provides a policy for you. These policies are, are huge manuals for red flag, 50, 60 pages. Um, so if you can find a provider that will provide you that and then ties in their policies and procedures with their system so there's an alignment there. Um, it's going to be a good policy, and, and it's going to be an easy policy for you to implement in your dealership. And the last piece is that you want the Ottawa questions so that you can remediate easily and quickly. Um, that's it for the red flag piece. Again, if you have questions, I'm, I have only have a half hour here, so I'm hitting these pretty quickly. If you have any questions regarding red flag, please uh, submit them, and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so we're going to talk about risk-based pricing notices. Again, this is a Consumer education piece, notifying your consumers of you know how strong their credit is or how strong it may not be, so that they can become more aware of their credit file, um, and thus uh, maybe strengthening consumer power, buying power by uh, education driving scores higher. Um, so, what is risk-based pricing? This is where you're you're varying the price of or the, maybe it's the interest rate, um, you're varying that based on their credit score. So based on someone's credit score is going to be the terms of the credit that they're offered. Um, 
it occurs at your dealership when you offer credit on material terms that are materially less favorable than your most favorable material terms. So people with lower credit um, might be offered a higher interest rate loan. Uh, that's risk-based pricing. Um, when the regulation first came out, the definition of how you can determine who uh, should receive a risk-based pricing notice was pretty complex. You know, a lot of confusion. Do I need to supply a risk-based pricing notice to everybody that applies, or is it just a portion? Well, the original legislation said only a portion. And they gave you um, a definition um, for that, which is pretty complicated. We're going to touch on it a little bit just to show you why it's easier just to give one to everyone. Um, one thing is that this regulation um, sort of closes the, the loop or you know, maybe answers the question, is a dealership responsible for this adverse action in risk-based pricing? Um, it defines that the dealers are arrangers of credit, arrangers of credit and a participating creditor. So it sort of ties the dealership into this legislation that, and it absolutely mentions dealerships specifically. Um, and it talks about that third party relationship with the financial institution. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, I talked about when the legislation first came out, uh, that it gave you three methods to determine who should receive a risk-based pricing notice. So it, it wanted to determine um, the majority of your customers who might receive less favorable terms. And you can determine your, your score cutoff, and it equates to a 40-60 rule where 40% above of your applicants above a score, a score cutoff, and 60% below, it wants you to give the notice to the 60%. And, it, and you constantly have to be evaluating what that score cutoff is. You have to do it a minimum annually, um, but they want you to determine, you know, where's your score cutoff um, and monitoring it and how you came to that, that determination and deliver it to the 60% of applicants who fall below that. So it's not just a, defined by a lender, it's defined by a 40-60 rule. They also gave a tiered pricing method if you're doing tiers. It's a percentage of the applicants and how they fall into those tiers. Um, so these methods are very uh, subjective and, and require a lot of constant manual calculation and just a, re, a redetermination of your policy. And so they realized it was complicated and too complicated. Um, so they came out with an exception notice. Um, this, the exception, the rule that the section notice is you have to deliver it to everyone you pull credit on. And everyone you are your primary lenders. If you're pushing your applicants to a primary lender, you're not pulling credit. You still, because you're that participating creditor, you're still responsible for risk-based pricing notices. So if you're doing that today and not delivering the notice, you're out of compliance. Um, the exception notice is very, uh, it's defined, there's even an example of it in the legislation, and most providers today of credit uh, also provide this risk-based pricing notice for you to deliver to the consumer. Um, some of the advantages, again, you don't have to determine who gets it, everybody gets it. Uh, they give you an example, so it's pretty simple to follow. But it does contain credit information, so it has to be generated by your credit provider. Uh, the other piece that's, that's nice, again, we have to have a written policy in place on who, how you're defining who gets it, how you're ensuring everyone gets it, and then how you're monitoring and you're reporting. How am I going to tell management at the end of the month that this group of applicants came in, I pulled credit, and every one of the applicants received this risk-based pricing notice from an auditing component. How can I audit it, and how can I tell management that um, with 100% certainty they received the notice? When do you have to deliver it to the consumer? Uh, it's, the legislation says as soon as possible after you obtain this credit score, but in all cases before the financial tra transaction has been finalized. So you have to uh, 
um, give that notice to the consumer before the paperwork is signed. Uh, real quickly, what's the notice include? Again, remember it's meant to educate the consumer. It contains the score, the bureau which was utilized to generate the score, um, the range of possible scores under that, that scorecard, a graphical representation of where the consumer lies nationally with their score. You know, they rank 60 percentile with the score. You know, how they compare to other consumers. Um, it's going to encourage them to verify the accuracy. It tells them how to get a free copy of their credit report. It also instructs them if they notice any inaccurate information in the credit report, how to um, you know, report that to the bureaus. Again, what's at stake? Uh, $3,500 for each knowing violation. So again, if you don't have a policy in place and they come in, um, that, the amount of dollars that your dealership is fined can add up pretty quickly and, and can really cripple your dealership. Uh, again, you have to have a policy defined, um, a written policy defined in place, and you're training your your dealership users and you're also your compliance officers monitoring to ensure everyone's trained and to ensure this notice is being delivered. He, you know, once a month at the end of the month or the beginning of the following month, he puts, you know, he creates a folder and it says, "Okay, this is my report." Um, this is uh, who we delivered risk-based pricing notices to. This is who we pulled credit on. You can see we are 100% compliant. Um, again, you know the document. You have to have a written dot policy in place. The other thing, make sure again. This is back to consolidating your your where you're pulling credit from, which systems, because every system you pull credit from, you need to have this policy policy in place. So minimize the systems helps minimize uh, the audit and the reporting that you have in place. And again, make sure that your policy can, covers 100% of your applicants. Think about how an applicant comes into your credit system and make sure you have it covered. Uh, some of the features to look for to, to make this process easier for you, um, again, Having the notice available at the time you pull credit is a nice to have or almost a must to have so that you can generate that notice when that person is sitting in that finance office when his credit report is pulled and hand that to him. Um, track a system that tracks whether or not that notice was printed. Um, uh, a nice to have is a mailing solution that anybody that you don't print that notice for, a copy of that notice will automatically be mailed to that consumer. So it's what we call a backstop, so that you can show, OK, I didn't print the notice, but it was mailed, and here's when it was mailed. Um, that's a, a real nice to have. There's, uh, it, it's good to know that anybody that a manual process might miss is going to be picked up by an automated process. So it, it gives you a, a comfort level that everybody is going to receive that notice. And then you want to you know, retain a system that will retain the history. And again, that reporting component is so important. Uh, it's going to retain who printed it, when they printed it. And you have a reporting solution that includes the various delivery methods and when each applicant uh, was uh, delivered their notice. Um, so that concludes risk-based pricing notices. Uh, now I'm going to talk about adverse action notices. And again, um, you know, Probably about 10 years ago, if you talked to a dealership, they would say, oh, my lender's got that covered. Well, no. Dealerships are a participating creditor. They, adverse action happens in every dealership. And every dealership needs to have an adverse action notice in place. Um, again, here you can see that term in the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, that participating creditor. And that other legislation, the risk-based pricing notice, stated that dealers are a participating creditor. So this is, this is probably the most confusing of uh, the three or the four topics that we're going to cover today. Where does adverse action occur in the dealership? Um, various opinions are pretty much all over the map. 
uh, we recommend no matter what your opinion is, you document it. Document it, have a policy in place, have a written policy that adheres to what your opinion is. Because again, if that auditor comes in, as long as you have a policy in place and you're enforcing that policy, he's going to be much more lenient if, even if your definition varies for what his expectations are. Um, he's, he might correct you, but I, I believe that they, um, they'll be much more lenient and they won't dig as deep. He might come back in six months to see that you've modified your policy but he's going to be much more lenient if you have something in place. You're just not ignoring your obligation or making a stand that you don't believe it occurs at all. It does occur in your dealership. Um, if you have any questions or not in a, or scenarios, feel free to ask them at the end. Uh, but I have yet to find a scenario where adverse does not occur in a dealership. Uh, what's at stake? Um, here the penalties can be even bigger than the risk-based pricing and red flag because uh, I believe it's risk-based pricing that says it cannot be a civil action. Well, these can be civil actions. And we all know that there are law groups out there that sort of just are, are sniffing around looking for dealerships who might be in noncompliance and trying to gather enough consumers for a civil action. And, we, and you don't want to be a part of that. Okay, so when to send an adverse. I'm going to talk a little bit about when adverse might occur in your dealership. Um, we work with all dealerships. We recommend the best practice, but some dealerships already have a defined best practice. And we work with any dealership's best practice to help them implement it and help them to automate it as much as possible. Um, some of the things that we've seen, you know, uh, every customer who a dealership obtains a credit report but did not sell a car to, has been some of the dealerships policies that we've implemented. Um, and that's a real easy one to automate. Um, every customer from whom a dealership obtains a credit report is declined by a dealer. So if you're obtaining credit reports prior to submitting them to your primary lender, or maybe you have a captive that you're submitting them to, anybody you determine not to submit to their credit, uh, they're, you're captive because of their credit, uh, that's when adverse begins, because you made a decision prior to submitting it based on their credit not to submit it. Um, every customer for whom the dealership obtains a credit report below a certain cutoff. Um, the, in certain dealerships uh, want to send an adverse action notice uh, that aligns with their primary lender. Like they have a primary lender that they're targeting consumers for when they walk into the dealership, and they know what that lender's cutoff can be. You can set a score cutoff, so anybody that falls below that um, could then receive a notice, or at least be identified to receive a notice. Um, so a little bit more on where does adverse occur within the dealership. Um, Here's an example. Dealer takes a credit application from a customer to finance. Uh, they cannot find a buyer for the installment sales contract. Uh, they are unable to offer financing. That's adverse. Uh, if, if you, let's say you send that to three finance companies, they all decline them, they will be receiving an adverse action letter from all three finance companies, or they should be, according to the law. But you must also send them an adverse action notice because they ended up, um, you ended up not offering them any financing. A uh, customer applies for credit on certain terms, such as you know uh, maybe a zero percent zero percent financing option, um, and then you offer them on different terms. It's called the counter offer. Right, that uh, language is specified in in NADA's. Um, flow chart of who should receive an adverse. Uh, if they don't accept that counteroffer, you're required to provide them an adverse action notice. So one of the best practices that we recommend is you tie it into your score cutoff with your primary lender, um, because anybody that you don't send to your primary lender, or maybe send to a subsequent lender after the primary lender declined them, um, that's a counteroffer. You're making a counteroffer 
you pulled their credit, you know they're not going to um, be approved by Ford Credit. So I'm going to send them to a local credit union or a local finance. That's a counteroffer because you submitted them with the intention um, to send that credit application to Ford Credit. Um, again, the items that your dealership must have in place, pretty similar to the other things that we've talked about so far. You have to have a document that defines your policies. You have to have a written policy in place. Um, and if it, in, it includes a, a legal opinion that you've obtained or an, it's a, a state association or some other automotive association, have that opinion as part of your policy because at least um, Again, the auditor is going to see that, and they're going to see that you're trying, you're making an attempt, you recognize your responsibility, and you're making an attempt to follow the letter of the law. And, and you have an opinion to back up your dealership's policy. And if they see that you're doing that, again, they're going to be much more lenient, and they're not going to dig as deep. Um, again, some of the things that the policy must include, you know, Again, where you're pulling credit, because it, your policy has to state, if you pull someone's credit, how are you delivering an adverse action notice? How are you determining um, if an adverse action notice should be delivered? Uh, if you can automate your solution, we automate solutions all the time for dealers. Um, if it, it might require the score cut off, um, it, it could be tied into if they print it locally at the dealership could be tied into if they sold them a car or not. Uh, an automated solution is always the best solution. It's going to start by flagging all your consumers who are eligible for a notice, and maybe it's going to uh, you know, identify, un unselect those that are printed locally, but it's going to report that you delivered a notice locally, and then it's also going to report on those that you didn't print that you mailed the notice to. So you want to automate it so that you can sleep at night knowing that no matter what happens, everybody's being delivered a notice that should be. And again, you can see this last, it, you know, who's going to audit your program, who's going to monitor it, what are the tools they're using to monitor it and audit it, things that must be defined in the policy and things that you must have in place. If you have a compliance officer in place and you have policies in place covering these regulations, uh, your dealership is going to get very close to a passing grade, and if your uh, policies align with what the auditor has in place, you're going to get flying colors, and you may never hear from them again. Um, just uh, features to look for. I think I talked about a lot of these. You know, generates a letter automatically. Um, system tracks whether or not you printed it, so that you can audit and have reporting that supports your audits. Uh, an automated mailing solution for those that were identified should receive one but maybe didn't have one printed locally is a good backstop. And you know, make sure your policy that you have in place coincides with the processes you have in place. Uh, again, retain a history of the letters that were generated, an important aspect of the reporting. So uh, a couple of takeaways. Um, you can't do you can't do anything. I think the time to, uh, to do anything, there's so much um, information education materials out there in compliance. I, most of the trade shows I go to today have, um, have breakout sessions or seminars on compliance. Uh, there's too much education out there that ignoring it and doing nothing is going to be acceptable. It's, um, and the cost of the fines could put your dealership in jeopardy. You have to have something in place have policies in place. That should, you know, your takeaway should be to define a compliance officer and ask first step, have written policies put in place. And make sure you're following compliance um, according to those, compo those policies. Make sure you're training your employees. Make, if you have turnover, make sure you're accounting for that. Maybe part of your policy and part of your folder contains who your employees are and when they were trained. Um, I, this is, we understand that this is an additional burden, additional cost to the dealership, um, but it's, it's something that's in place, that uh, the cost to not to have this in place is even greater, and the risk of your dealership at stake 
um, is too much to do nothing. And last, we talked about, and, and hopefully you can see the benefits of consolidating your sources of credit. Um, that's it for the presentation portion. Nick, if you wanted to go ahead and open it up for questions and answers. Great, great job, Ken. A, a lot of uh, critical information to to get through in a, in a short amount of time. And and just just a reminder that we are recording today's session, so that the uh, large amount of information that uh, Ken shared and and went over you. We'll have the opportunity to, to review that material uh, later on as, as we're recording the session, and we'll get that uh, a link to you to see that recording as, as quickly as possible. Uh, so, so just to, to circle back, Ken, a um, uh, dealer who's, who's joining us uh, that is, is asking that uh, if his, through his online listings or, or marketing, if, if the dealership receives a uh, a credit app uh, from that uh, service provider, it, is the dealership responsible for relaying that information even if they don't use it? Uh, what, what would you suggest that that dealer do? Um, I, uh, the first question would be whose name was the credit report pulled in? Um, if that online uh, lead generating system is using your credit bureau information, um, and that code is being pulled in your name, that credit report, absolutely. And that's part of the policy when I say, you know, ensure that your policy includes 100% of the applicants that you pulled. Those have to be included in that group. You're responsible if that credit report was pulled in your name to ensure that that consumer was delivered a risk-based pricing notice, um, that you, you're performing red flag authentication. You might have you know, in that situation, you might already be doing it if that reaches your finance office. Um, but, uh, you know, the risk-based pricing notice is something that that provider should be able to provide back to that consumer, maybe in an electronic form in an email after the application. Or, you know, maybe that's something your Internet manager can ensure is being delivered, but it needs to be defined how that consumer is receiving it. Very good, very good. And, and uh, along those lines, uh, another dealer is, is wondering that uh, how, can, how can the store prove that uh, they mailed the adverse action uh, letter with, without a, a tracking number for each one as, as, a, as a possibility? Uh, wh what are some steps that, that dealers can take to, to ensure to, to regulators that they did, in fact, uh, send the, the document? Um, well, if you're mailing, you're typically your mailhouse provider, and uh, you know we have uh, in our solution, right? We have that consumer's information. We log it in our system that it was mailed, um, and then we also maintain uh, the file that was uploaded to the post office. So, if you have uh, that, uh, the system that uh, you know marking that applicant to receive a mailed notice. Um, you know, as long as your policy is defined of how that file gets to the post office, and you can, um, and you can audit that it was included in that file, uh, you need those pieces for the mailing. Now, if you're delivering notices in person, um, you can. Some policies that I've seen that the dealer is having the consumer sign a copy, and they put a copy of that in the deal check. Now, one of the things uh, that that adds a little bit more manual process to the audit aspect, right? You have to audit. So you have to be, and your reporting has to show that they were printed locally. Um, and so you would have to audit that. You'd have to pull uh, a sampling, a relative sampling, and you know go into those files and ensure that that signed applicant is there. Um, we, uh, and I know other providers do as well, retain the user ID, the IP address, the date and the time of that user that printed that application or printed that letter locally and retain that and that information is also contained in the audit report. Big piece is the definition of how you're going to uh, monitor it and how you're going to audit it. 
Very good, very good, Ken. Uh, another another dealer on the line is is asking, saying that uh, they're a, they're actually a Harley Davidson dealership, and they send uh, most of their credit applications to the to the captive for the store, HDFS. Uh, do, do they have to deliver uh, adverse action and, and risk-based price, pricing notices since they're pushing most of their apps and, and paper to the captive? Yeah, yes. Um, and both, the answer to both is yes. Uh, uh, I'll take one at a time. Adverse, I heard they're sending most applicants to Harley-Davidson financing. Well, what are they doing to those that they don't send to Harley-Davidson? Um, are they turning applicants away totally? Are they sending those applicants to some subprime lenders, local credit unions? That's where the adverse occurs. You determine not to push it to Harley. If you don't offer them any financing at all, at a minimum, you need an adverse action in place. And that can be your policy. You can define that. Um, on risk-based pricing, you absolutely have to deliver the risk-based pricing notice to the consumer. If you're sending most of your applications to Harley, they need to be delivering back to you a risk-based pricing notice that you can deliver to the consumer. Um, and then anyone that you might pull credit locally outside of Harley, you have to deliver risk-based pricing notices as well. Um, they can share that risk-based pricing notice with you because you are a third party in that relationship. Um, but you have to deliver it, and you have to record uh, that you delivered it. Very good, very good. A, a, a follow up from from the one of the first questions we, we tackled uh, during this segment, Ken, is uh, that the dealer has uh, has gotten the um, uh, credit application from from their service provider, but but they've not opened it or sent it on to any of their finance companies in their network or to a credit bureau. They 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 haven't touched it. Uh, what re what recommendations uh, would you give to, to that dealer who has, hasn't done anything with that particular uh, credit application? Um, I, I'd, it, I guess it would be the how it was presented to the consumer. Were they applying for credit specifically for their dealership? And has their credit bureau uh, file been obtained? And if it has been obtained, was it obtained in the dealership's name? Um, if the answer to all those questions are no, and they, um, then I don't, they don't have any responsibility um, if, if they haven't opened it or they haven't done, touched anything with the application. But based on some of the other answers, uh, they would have responsibilities. If a credit report was pulled, it was pulled in their name, or they were presented, the consumer was presented that uh, they were going to be applying for credit with your dealership. Um, then yes, uh, you have responsibilities there. All right, all right, very good. A few, few more questions here, our, our remaining time here with uh, Ken Hill, the Managing Director of, of 700 Credit. We're going through uh, some, some best practices in regard to uh, risk-based pricing, adverse action notices, and, and the like. And, and we welcome your questions. Uh, if you still have some, please use the questions box on the on the GoToWebinar control panel. And, and we remind you that we are recording today's session, and we'll get uh, the material from Ken's presentation and, and this recording to you as, as quickly as possible. So keep watch of your inbox uh, for a message containing that material. Uh, another person who's joining us today, Ken, is saying that they're an auto finance company, and they pull uh, consumers' credit reports in-house, but we don't get their credit score. Uh, would the risk-based pricing notices uh, still apply to that operation? Um, yeah, we've had uh, we've worked with uh, some finance companies that have had that situation. Um, you're still that. Eliminating the score doesn't, uh, and we've discussed this with some of our um, counsel, it does not remove the responsibility of the, the risk-based pricing notice. Um, and I know I've, I've seen some dealerships remove the score, but the far majority have added the score. So 
so that they could be in uh, compliance with the regulation. Very good, very good. Uh, well, I, I guess finally here in, a, in our closing moments here, Ken, if if a if a dealership uh, has maybe just some rudimentary uh, plans in place or or needs uh, to to take some steps to uh, make sure that their regulatory bases are are covered, uh, a lot of information was was presented here today. What what would you recommend as maybe some some initial steps uh, for that store to take to, to get the ball rolling? Um, I, similar to what I mentioned before is, you know, define who's going to be responsible for compliance within your dealership. Um, educate them, you know, have them seek out uh, you know, state associations, NADA sites to obtain um, what they should be doing. They can go to their credit provider. Most Credit providers now are, uh, you know, providing uh, best practices solutions that are tied in with their application, uh, but and and move towards defining policies for each of the compliance requirements and getting them in place. Very good. And and, and finally, Ken, if if uh, a dealer wants to uh, find out more information uh, about what 700 credit offers. Uh, how, what, 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 what can they do to, to reach you or, or your colleagues at the firm? Uh, yeah, they can go to our, our website. Uh, there's several web forms on our website that they can fill out, and one of our reps or product specialists would be more than happy. We also offer um, a compliance audit uh, free of charge to look at the policies and processes you have in place and the procedures you have in place. Um, and to talk to you about you know what you need to do to move towards compliance, um, be more than happy to talk to any dealer that would like to discuss it. Excellent, excellent. That's that's Ken Hill. He's the managing director of of Seven Hundred Credit and and did a great job with uh, today's today's presentation. So th thank you so much, Ken. Thank you, and I appreciate everybody taking time out today. So thank you so much for joining us. Watch for a, a link to the recording from today's session. Uh, you'll be able to, to review the material and, and share it with other uh, individuals and staff members at your store. So thank you again for joining us.